Chapter Twelve, Part One of the Legends of the Jews, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume Four, by Lewis Ginsburg. Chapter Twelve. Esther. The Feast for the Grandees. The Book of Esther is the last of the scriptural writings. The subsequent history of Israel and all his suffering we know only through oral tradition. For this reason, the heroine of the last canonical book was named Esther, that is, Venus, the morning star, which sheds its light after all the other stars have ceased to shine, and while the sun still delays to rise. Thus the deeds of Queen Esther cast a ray of light forward into Israel's history at its darkest. The Jews, at the time of Osuerus, were like the dove about to enter her nest wherein a snake lies coiled. Yet she cannot withdraw, because a falcon bides without to swoop down upon her. In Shushan the Jews were in the clutches of Haman, and in other lands they were at the mercy of many murderous enemies to their race, ready to do the bidding of Haman to destroy and to slay them and cause them to perish. But the rescue of the Jews from the hand of their adversaries is only a part of this wonderful chapter in the history of Israel. No less important is the exalted station to which they rose in the realm of Ahasuerus after the fall of Haman especially the power and dignity to which Esther herself attained. On this account, the magnificent feast prepared by Ahasuerus for his subjects belongs to the history of Esther. The splendor of his feast is the gauge whereby to measure the wealth and power she later enjoyed. Ahasuerus was not the king of Persia by right of birth. He owed his position to his vast wealth with which he purchased dominion over the whole world. He had various reasons for giving a gorgeous feast. The third year of his reign was the seventieth since the beginning of Nebuchadnezzar's rule, and Ahasuerus thought it quite certain that the time had passed for the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah foretelling the return of Israel to the Holy Land. The temple was still in ruins and Ahasuerus was convinced that the Jewish kingdom would never again be restored. Needless to say, it was not Jeremiah who erred. Not with the ascension of King Nebuchadnezzar had the prophet's term of years begun, but with the destruction of Jerusalem. Reckoned in this way, the seventy years of desolation were at an end exactly at the time when Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, permitted the rebuilding of the temple. Beside this mistaken cause for a celebration, there were reasons personal to Ahasuerus why he desired to give expression to joy. A short time before, he had crushed a rebellion against himself, and this victory he wanted to celebrate with pomp and ceremony. The first part of the celebration was given over to the hundred and twenty-seven rulers of the hundred and twenty-seven provinces of his empire. His purpose was to win the devotion of those of them with whom otherwise he did not come in direct contact. But can it be said with certainty that this was a good policy? If he had not first made sure of the loyalty of his capital, was it not dangerous to have these rulers near him in case of an insurrection? For six whole months he celebrated the feast for the grandees, the nobles, and the high officials, the latter of whom, according to the Constitution, were all required to be medians under the Persian king Ahasuerus, as they would have had to be Persians under a median king. This was the program of the feast. In the first month, Ahasuerus showed his treasures to his guests. In the second, the delegates of the king's royal vassals saw them. 
in the third the presents were exposed to view in the fourth the guests were invited to admire his literary possessions among them the sacred scroll in the fifth his pearl and diamond studded ornaments of gold were put on exhibition and in the sixth he displayed the treasures which had been given him as tribute all this vast wealth however appertained to the crown it was not his personal property when nebuchadnezzar felt his end draw nigh he resolved to sink his immense treasures in the euphrates rather than let them ascend to his son evil merodach so great was his miserliness but again when cyrus gave the jews permission to build the temple his divinely appointed reward was that he discovered the spot in the river at which the treasures were sunk and he was permitted to take possession of them these were the treasures of which ahasuerus availed himself to glorify his feast so prodigious were they that during the six months of the feast he unlocked six treasure chambers daily to display their contents to his guests when ahasuerus boasted of his wealth which he had no right to do as his treasures had come from the temple god said verily has the creature of flesh and blood any possessions of his own i alone possess treasures for the silver is mine and the gold is mine among the treasures displayed were the temple vessels which ahasuerus had desecrated in his drinking bouts when the noble jews who had been invited to the capital saw these they began to weep and they refused to take further part in the festivities thereupon the king commanded that a separate place be assigned to the jews so that their eyes might be spared the painful sight this was not the only incident that aroused poignant memories in them for ahasuerus arrayed himself in the robes of state once belonging to the high priests at jerusalem and this too made the jews smart uncomfortably the persian king had wanted to mount the throne of solomon besides but herein he was thwarted because its ingenious construction was an enigma to him egyptian artificers tried to fashion a throne after the model of solomon's but in vain after two years work they managed to produce a weak imitation of it and upon this ahasuerus sat during his splendid feast the festivities in shushan at the expiration of the hundred and eighty days allotted to the feast for the nobles ahasuerus arranged a great celebration for the residents of shushan the capital city of elam from the creation of the world until after the deluge the unwritten law had been in force that the first-born son of the patriarchs was to be the ruler of the world thus seth was the successor to adam and he was followed in turn by enosh and so the succession went on from first-born son to first-born son down to noah and his oldest son shem now the first-born son of shem was elam and according to custom he should have been given the universal dominion which was his heritage shem being a prophet knew that abraham and his posterity the israelites would not spring from the family of elam but from that of arpashad therefore he named arpashad as his successor and through him rulership descended to abraham and so to isaac jacob and judah and to david and his posterity down to the last judean king zedekiah who was deprived of his sovereignty by nebuchadnezzar then it was that god spake thus so long as the government rested in the hands of my children i was prepared to exercise patience the misdeeds of the one were made good by the other if one of them was wicked the other was pious but now that the dominions has been wrested from my children it shall at least revert to its original possessors elam was the first-born son of shem and his seed shall be given the rule so it happened that shushan the capital city of elam 
became the seat of government. That there were any celebrations in Shushan was due to Haman, who even in those early days was devising intriguings against the Jews. He appeared before Ahasuerus and said, O king, this people is a peculiar people. May it please thee to destroy it. Ahasuerus replied, I fear the God of this people. He is very mighty, and I bear in mind what befell Pharaoh for his wicked treatment of the Israelites. Their God, said Haman, hates an unchaste life. Do thou, therefore, prepare feasts for them, and order them to take part in the merry-makings. Have them eat and drink, and act as their heart desireth, so that their God may become wrathful against them. When Mordecai heard of the feasts that were planned, he advised the Jews not to join in them. All the prominent men of his people, and many of the lower classes, took his advice to heart. They fled from Shushan to avoid being compelled to take part in the festivities. The rest remained in the city and yielded to force. They participated in the celebrations and even permitted themselves to eat of food prepared by the heathen. Though the king had taken care not to offend the religious conscience of the Jews in such details, he had been so punctilious that there was no need for them to drink wine touched by the hand of an idolater, let alone eat forbidden food. The arrangements for the feast were entirely in the charge of Haman and Mordecai, so that neither Jew nor Gentile might absent himself for religious reasons. It was the aim of the king to let every guest follow the inclination of his heart. When Ahasuerus issued the order, that the officers of his house were to do according to every man's pleasure. God became wroth with him. Thou villain, he said, canst thou do every man's pleasure? Suppose two men love the same woman, can both marry her? Two vessels sail forth together from a port. The one desires a south wind, the other a north wind. Canst thou produce a wind to satisfy the two? On the morrow, Haman and Mordecai will appear before thee. Wilt thou be able to side with both? The scene of the festivities was in the royal gardens. The upper branches of the high trees were made to interlace with each other so as to form vaulted arches, and the smaller trees, with aromatic foliage, were taken up out of the ground and placed in artfully constructed tents. From tree to tree stretched curtains of biases, white and sapphire blue, and vivid green and royal purple, fastened to their supports by ropes depending from round silver beams, these in turn resting on pillars of red, green, yellow, white, and glittering blue marble. The couches were made of delicate draperies, their frames stood on silver feet, and the rods attached to them were of gold. The floor was tiled with crystal and marble, outlined with precious stones, whose brilliance illuminated the scene far and wide. The wine and the other beverages were drunk only from golden vessels, yet Ahasuerus was so rich that no drinking cup was used more than a single time. But magnificent as these utensils of his were, when the holy vessels of the temple were brought in, the golden splendor of the others was dimmed. It turned dull as lead. The wine was in each case older than its drinker. To prevent intoxication from unaccustomed drinks, every guest was served with the wine indigenous to his native place. In general, Ahasuerus followed the Jewish rather than the Persian manner. It was a banquet rather than a drinking bout. In Persia, a custom prevailed that every participant in a banquet of wine had to drain a huge beaker far exceeding the drinking capacity of any human being, and to do it he must, though he lost reason and life. The office butler, accordingly, was very lucrative, because the guests at such wassails 
were in the habit of bribing him to purchase the liberty of drinking as little as they pleased or dared this persian habit of compelling excess in drinking was ignored at ahasuerus's banquet every guest did as he chose the royal bounty did not show itself in food and drink alone the king's guests could also indulge in the pleasures of the dance if they were so minded dancers were provided who charmed the company with their artistic figures displayed upon the purple-covered floor that the enjoyment of the participants might in no wise be marred as by separation from their families all were permitted to bring their households with them and merchants were released from the taxes imposed upon them so sure was ahasuerus of his success as a host that he dared say to his jewish guests will your god be able to match this banquet in the future world whereunto the jews replied the banquet god will prepare for the righteous in the world to come is that of which it is written no eye hath seen it but god's he will accomplish it for them that wait upon him if god were to offer us a banquet like unto thine o king we should say such as this we ate at the table of ahasuerus vashti's banquet the banquet given by queen vashti to the women differed but slightly from ahasuerus's she sought to emulate her husband's example even in the point of exhibiting treasures six store chambers she displayed daily to the women she had bidden as guests ay she did not even shirk from arraying herself in the high priestly garments the meats and dishes as at ahasuerus's table were palestinian only instead of wine liqueurs were served and sweets as the weak sex is subject to sudden attacks of indisposition the banquet was given in the halls of the palace so that the guests might at need withdraw to the adjoining chambers the gorgeously ornamented apartments of the palace besides were more attractive to the feminine taste than the normal beauties of the royal gardens for a woman would rather reside in beautiful chambers and possess beautiful cloths than eat fatted calves nothing interested the women more than to become acquainted with the arrangement of the interior of the palace for women are curious to know all things vashti granted their desire she showed them all there was to be seen describing every place as she came to it this is the dining hall this the wine room this the bedchamber vashti too was actuated by a political motive when she determined to give her banquet by inviting the wives of hostages in case the men rose in insurrection against the king for vashti knew the ways of statecraft she not only was the wife of a king but also the daughter of a king of belshazzar the night of belshazzar's murder in his own place vashti alarmed by the confusion that ensued and not knowing of the death of her father fled to the apartments in which he was in the habit of sitting the median darius had already ascended the throne of belshazzar and so it happened that vashti instead of finding the hoped-for refuge with her father ran straight into the hands of his successor but he had compassion with her and gave her to his son ahasuerus for wife the fate of vashti though ahasuerus had taken every precaution to prevent intemperate indulgence in wine his banquet revealed the essential difference between jewish and pagan festivities when jews are gathered about a festal board they discuss a halakha or a haggara or at the least a simple verse from the scriptures ahasuerus and his boon companions rounded out the banquet with prurient talk the persians lauded the charms of the women of their people while the medians admitted none superior to the median women then the fool ahasuerus up and spake my wife is neither a persian nor a median but a chaldean yet she excels all in beauty would you convince yourselves of the truth of my words 
Yes, shouted the company, who were deep in their cups. But that we may properly judge of her natural charms. Let her appear before us unadorned. Yes, without any apparel whatsoever. And Ahasuerus agreed to the shameless condition. The thing was from God, that so insensate a demand should be made of Vashti by the king. A whole week Mordecai had spent in fasting and praying, supplicating God to mete out punishment to Ahasuerus for his desecration of the temple utensils. On the seventh day of the week, on the Sabbath, when Mordecai, after his long fast, took food, because fasting is forbidden on the Sabbath day, God heard his prayer, and the prayer of the Sanhedrin. He sent down seven angels of confusion to put an end to Ahasuerus's pleasure. They were named Mehuman, Confusion, Bistha, Destruction of the House, Harbona, Annihilation, Bigtha, and Abagtha, the pressers of the wine press, for God had resolved to crush the court of Ahasuerus as one presses the juice from grapes in a press. Zitha, observer of immortality, and Carcass, knocker. There was a particular reason why this interruption of the feast took place on the Sabbath. Vashti was in the habit of forcing Jewish maidens to spin and weave on the Sabbath day, and to add to her cruelty, she would deprive them of all their clothes. It was on the Sabbath, therefore, that her punishment overtook her and for the same reason it was put into the king's heart to have her appear in public stripped of all clothing. Vashti recoiled from the king's revolting order. But it must not be supposed that she shrank from carrying it out because it offended her moral sense. She was not a whit better than her husband. She fairly reveled in the opportunity his command gave her to indulge in carnal pleasures once again, for it was exactly a week since she had been delivered of a child. But God sent the angel Gabriel to her to disfigure her countenance. Suddenly signs of leprosy appeared on her forehead, and the marks of other diseases on her person. In this state it was impossible for her to show herself to the king she made a virtue of necessity and worded her refusal to appear before him arrogantly say to ahasuerus o thou fool and madman hast thou lost thy reason by too much drinking i am vashti the daughter of belshazzar who was a son of nebuchadnezzar the nebuchadnezzar who scoffed at kings and unto whom princes were a derision and even thou wouldst not have been deemed worthy to run before my father's chariot as a courier. Had he lived, I should never have been given unto thee for wife. Not even those who suffered the death penalty during the reign of my forefather, Nebuchadnezzar, were stripped bare of their clothing. And thou demandest that I appear naked in public. Why, it is for thine own sake that I refuse to heed thy order." Either the people will decide that I do not come up to thy description of me, and will proclaim thee a liar, or, bewitched by my beauty, they will kill thee in order to gain possession of me, saying, Shall this fool be the master of so much beauty? The first lady of the Persian aristocracy encouraged Vashti to adhere to her resolution. Better, her adviser said, when Ahasuerus's second summons was delivered to Vashti, together with his threat to kill her unless she obeyed. Better the king should kill thee and annihilate thy beauty, than that thy person should be admired by other eyes than thy husband's, and thus thy name be disgraced, and the name of thy ancestors. When Vashti refused to obey the repeated command to appear before the king and the hundred and twenty-seven crowned princes of the realm, Ahasuerus turned to the Jewish sages and requested them to pass sentence upon his queen. Their thoughts ran in this wise, If we condemn the queen to death, 
we shall suffer for it as soon as Ahasuerus becomes sober, and hears it was at our advice that she was executed. But if we admonish him unto clemency now, while he is intoxicated, he will accuse us of not paying due deference to the majesty of the king. They therefore resolved upon neutrality. Since the destruction of the temple, they said to the king, since we have not dwelt in our land, we have lost the power to give sage advice, particularly in matters of life and death. Better seek counsel with the wise men of Ammon and Moab, who have ever dwelt at ease in their land, like wine that hath settled on its lees, and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel. Thereupon, Ahasuerus put his charge against Vashti before the seven princes of Persia, Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Mersina, and Memucan, who came from Africa, India, Edom, Tarsus, Mersa, Resin, and Jerusalem, respectively. The names of these seven officials, each representing his country, were indicative of their office. Karshina had the care of the animals, Shithar of the wine, Admatha of the land, Tarshish of the palace, Maris of the poultry, Marcina of the bakery, and Mimukin provided for the needs of all in the palace, his wife acting as housekeeper. This Mimukin, a native of Jerusalem, was none other than Daniel, called Mimukin, the appointed one, because he was designated by God to perform miracles and bring about the death of Vashti. When the king applied for advice to these seven nobles, Mamukin was the first to speak up. Though in rank he was inferior to the other six, as appears from the place his name occupies in the list. However, it is customary, as well among Persians as among Jews, in passing death sentence, to begin taking the vote with the youngest of the judges on the bench, to prevent the juniors and the less prominent from being overawed by the opinion of the more influential. It was Mamukin's advice to the king to make an example of Ashtai, so that in future no woman should dare refuse obedience to her husband. Daniel Mamukin had had unpleasant experiences in his conjugal life. He had married a wealthy Persian lady, who insisted upon speaking to him in her own language exclusively. Besides, personal antipathy existed between Daniel and Vashti. He had, in a measure, been the cause of her refusal to appear before the king and his princes. Vashti hated Daniel, because it was he who had prophesied his death to her father, and the extinction of his dynasty. She could not endure his sight. Wherefore, she would not show herself to the court in his presence. Also, it was Daniel who, by pronouncing the name of God, had caused the beauty of Vashti to vanish, and her face to be marred. In consequence of all this, Daniel advised not only that Vashti should be cast off, but that she should be made harmless forever by the hangman's hand. His advice was endorsed by his colleagues and approved by the king. That the king might not delay execution of the death sentence, and Daniel himself thus incur danger to his own life, he made Ahasuerus swear the most solemn oath known to the Persians, that it would be carried out forthwith. At the same time, a royal edict was promulgated, making it the duty of wives to obey their husbands, with special reference to Daniel's domestic difficulties. It was specified that the wife must speak the language of her lord and master. The execution of Vashti brought most disastrous consequences in its train. His whole empire, which is tantamount to saying the whole world, rose against Ahasuerus. The widespread rebellion was put down only after his marriage with Esther but not before it had inflicted upon him the loss of one hundred and twenty-seven provinces, the half of his kingdom. Such was his punishment for refusing permission to rebuild the temple. 
it was only after the fall of Haman, when Mordecai had been made the chancellor of the empire, that Ahasuerus succeeded in reducing the revolted provinces to submission. The death of Vashti was not undeserved punishment, for it had been she who had prevented the king from giving his consent to the rebuilding of the temple. "'Wilt thou rebuild the temple?' said she reproachfully, "'which my ancestors destroyed?' THE FOLLIES OF Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is the prototype of the unstable foolish ruler. He sacrificed his wife Vashti to his friend Haman Memukin, and later on again his friend Haman to his wife Esther. Folly possessed him, too, when he arranged extravagant festivities for guests from afar, before he had won, by means of kindly treatment, the friendship of his surroundings, of the inhabitants of his capital. Ridiculous is the word that describes his edict, bidding wives obey their husbands. Every one who read it exclaimed, To be sure a man is master in his own house. However, the silly decree served its purpose. It revealed his true character to the subjects of Ahasuerus, and thenceforward they attached little importance to his edicts. This was the reason why the decree of annihilation directed against the Jews failed of the effect expected by Haman and Ahasuerus. The people regarded it as but another of the king's foolish pranks, and therefore were ready to acquiesce to the revocation of the edict when it came. The king's true character appeared when he grew sober after the episode with Vashti. Learning that he had had her executed, he burst out furiously against his seven counsellors, and in turn ordered them to death. Foolish, too, is the only word to describe the manner in which he set about discovering the most beautiful woman in his dominion. King David, on a similar occasion, wisely sent out messengers who were to bring to him the most beautiful maiden in the land, and there was none who was not eager to enjoy the honor of giving a daughter of his to the king. Ahasuerus's method was to have his servants gather together a multitude of beautiful maidens and women from all parts, and among them he proposed to make choice. The result of this system was that the women concealed themselves to avoid being taken into the harem of the king, when it was not certain that they would be found worthy of becoming his queen. With his stupidity, Ahasuerus combined wantonness. He ordered force to be used in taking the maidens from their parents and the wives from their husbands, and then he confined them in his harem. On the other hand, the moral sense of the heathen was so degraded that many maidens displayed their charms to public view, so that they might be sure to attract the admiring attention of the royal emissaries. As for Esther, for four years Mordecai kept her concealed in a chamber, so that the king's scouts could not discover her. But her beauty had long been known to fame, and when they returned to Shushan, they had to confess to the king that the most superbly beautiful woman in the land eluded their search. Thereupon Ahasuerus issued a decree ordaining the death penalty for the woman who should secrete herself before his emissaries. There was nothing left for Mordecai to do but fetch Esther from her hiding place, and immediately she was espied and carried to the palace of the king. Mordecai The descent of Mordecai and of his niece Esther is disposed of in a few words in the scripture, but he could trace it all the way back to the patriarch Jacob, from whom he was forty-five degrees removed. Beside the father of Mordecai, the only ancestor of his who is mentioned by name, is Shimei, and he is mentioned for a specific reason. This Shimei is none other than the notorious son of Gera, the rebel who had so scoffed and mocked at David, fleeing before Absalom, that he would have been killed by Abishai if David had not generously interfered in his favor. David's prophetic eye discerned in Shimei the ancestor of Israel's savior in the time of Ahasuerus. For this reason, he dealt leniently with him, 
and on his deathbed he bade his son solomon reserve vengeance until shimei should have reached old age and could beget no more children thus mordecai deserves both appellations the benjaminite and the judean for he owed his existence not only to his actual benjamite forebears on his father's side but also to the judean david who kept his ancestor shimei alive shimei's distinction as the ancestor of israel's redeemer was due to the merits of his wife when jonathan and ahimaaz david's spies in his war against his son fled before the meridians of absalom they found the gate of shimei's house open entering they concealed themselves in the well that they escaped detection was due to the ruse of shimei's pious wife she quickly transformed the well into a lady's chamber when absalom's men came and looked about they desisted from searching the place because they reasoned that men as saintly as jonathan and ahimaaz would not have taken refuge in the private apartment of a woman god determined that for having rescued two pious men he would reward her with two pious descendants who should in turn avert the ruin of jerusalem on his mother's side mordecai was in very deed a member of the tribe of judah in any event he was a son of judah in the true sense of the word he publicly acknowledged himself a jew and he refused to touch of the forbidden food which ahasuerus set before his guest at his banquet his other appellatives likewise point to his piety and his excellencies his name mordecai for instance consists of more meaning myrrh and decai pure for he was as refined and noble as pure myrrh again he is called benjar because he illuminated the eyes of israel and ben kish because when he knocked at the gates of the divine mercy they were opened unto him which is likewise the origin of his name ben shimei for he was heard by god when he offered up prayer still another of mordecai's epithets was bilshan master of languages being a member of the great sanhedrin he understood all the seventy languages spoken in the world more than that he knew the language of the deaf mutes it once happened that no new grain could be obtained at passover time a deaf mute came and pointed with one hand to the roof and with the other to the cottage mordecai understood that these signs meant a locality by the name of gagat zeraphim cottage roofs and lo new grain was found there for the omer offering on another occasion a deaf mute pointed with one hand to his eye and with the other to the staple of the bolt on the door mordecai understood that he meant a place called in soker dry well for eye and spring are the same word in aramaic and sikra also has a double meaning staple and exhaustion mordecai belonged to the highest aristocracy of jerusalem he was of royal blood and he was deported to babylonian together with king jeconiai by nebuchadnezzar who at that time exiled only the great of the land later he returned to palestine but remained only for a time he preferred to live in the dysphoria and watch over the education of esther when cyrus and darius captured babylon mordecai daniel and the jewish community of the conquered city occupied king cyrus to shushan accompanied king cyrus to shushan where mordecai established his academy end of chapter 12 part 1 recording by scarlet louisiana chapter 12 part 2 of the legends of the jews volume 4 this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 4, by Louis Ginberg. 
Chapter Twelve Esther's Beauty and Piety. The birth of Esther caused the death of her mother. Her father had died a little while before, so she was entirely orphaned. Mordecai and his wife interested themselves in the poor babe. His wife became her nurse, and he himself did not hesitate, when there was need for it, to do services for the child that are usually performed only by women. Both her names, Esther, as well as Hadassah, are descriptive of her virtues. Hadassah, or Myrtle, she is called, because her good deeds spread her fame abroad, as the sweet fragrance of the myrtle pervades the air in which it grows. In general, the myrtle is symbolic of the pious, because, as the myrtle is ever green, summer and winter alike, so the saints never suffer dishonor, either in this world or in the world to come. In another way, Esther resembled the myrtle, which, in spite of its pleasant scent, has a bitter taste. Esther was pleasant to the Jews, but bitterness itself to Haman, and all who belonged to him. The name Esther is equally significant. In Hebrew it means, She who conceals, a fitting name for the niece of Mordecai, the woman who well knew how to guard a secret, and long hid her descent and faith from the king and the court. She herself had been kept concealed for years in the house of her uncle, withdrawn from the searching eyes of the king's spies. Above all, she was hidden light that suddenly shone upon Israel in his rayless darkness. In build, Esther was neither tall nor short. She was exactly of average height, another reason for calling her Myrtle a plant which likewise is neither large nor small. In point of fact, Esther was not a beauty in the real sense of the word. The beholder was bewitched by her grace and her charm, and that in spite of her somewhat sallow, myrtle-like complexion. More than this, her enchanting grace was not the grace of youth, for she was seventy-five years old when she came to court, and captivated the hearts of all who saw her, from king to eunuch. This was in fulfillment of the prophecy which God made to Abraham when he was leaving the home of his father. Thou art leaving the house of thy father at the age of seventy-five. As thou livest, the deliverer of thy children in Medea also shall be seventy-five years old. Another historical event pointed forward to Esther's achievement. When the Jews, after the destruction of Jerusalem, broke out into the wail, We are orphans and fatherless, God said. In very sooth, the Redeemer, whom I shall send unto you in Medea, shall also be an orphan fatherless and motherless. Ahasuerus put Esther between two groups of beauties, Medean beauties to right of her, and Persian beauties to left of her. Yet Esther's comeliness outshone them all. Not even Joseph could vie with the Jewish queen in grace. Grace was suspended above him, but Esther was fairly laden down with it. Whoever saw her pronounced her the ideal of beauty of his nation. The general exclamation was, This one is worthy of being queen. In vain Ahasuerus had sought a wife for four years, in vain fathers had spent time and money bringing their daughters to him, in the hope that one or the other would appeal to his fancy. None among the maidens, none among the women, pleased Ahasuerus. But scarcely had he set eyes upon Esther when he thrilled with the feeling that he had at last found what he had long yearned for. All these years— the portrait of Vashti had hung in his chamber. He had not forgotten his rejected queen. But once he beheld Esther, Vashti's picture was replaced by hers. Maiden grace and womanly charm were in her united. The change in her worldly position wrought no change in Esther's ways and manners. As she retained her beauty until old age, 
so the queen remained as pure in mind and soul as ever the simple maiden had been all the other women who entered the gates of the royal palace made exaggerated demands esther's demeanor continued modest and unassuming the others insisted that the seven girl pages assigned to them should have certain peculiar qualities as that they should not differ each from her mistress in complexion and height esther uttered no wish whatsoever but her unpretending ways were far from pleasing to higai chief of the eunuchs of the harem he feared lest the king discover that esther did nothing to preserve her beauty and would put the blame for it upon him an accusation that might bring him to the gallows to avoid such a fate he loaded esther down with resplendent jewels distinguishing her beyond all the other women gathered in the palace as joseph by means of costly gifts lavished upon him had singled out her ancestor benjamin from among his brethren hegai paid particular attention to what esther ate for her he brought dishes from the royal table which however she refused obstinately to touch only such things passed her lips as were permitted to jews she lived entirely on vegetable food as hananiah michel and azariah had aforetimes done at the court of nebuchadnezzar the forbidden tidbits she passed over to the non-jewish servants her personal attendants were seven jewish maidens as consistently pious as herself whose devotion to the ritual law esther could depend upon otherwise esther was cut off from all intercourse with jews and she was in danger of forgetting when the sabbath bath came around she therefore adopted the device of giving her seven attendants peculiar names to keep her in mind of the passage of time the first one was called Holta, workaday, and she was in attendance upon Esther on Sundays. On Mondays, she was served by Rikita to remind her of Rikia, the firmament, which was created on the second day of the world. Tuesday's maid was called Genuda, garden, the third day of creation, having produced the world of plants. On Wednesday, she was reminded by Neharida's name the luminous that it was the day on which god had made the great luminaries to shed their light in the sky on thursday by rashida movement for on the fifth day the first animated beings were created on friday the day on which the beasts came into being by herfida little ewe lamb and on the sabbath her bidding was done by Rigoida, rest. Thus she was sure to remember the Sabbath day, week after week. Mordecai's daily visits to the gate of the palace had a similar purpose. Thus Esther was afforded the opportunity of obtaining instruction from him on all ritual doubts that might assail her. This lively interest displayed by Mordecai in Esther's physical and spiritual welfare is not wholly attributable to an uncle's and guardian's solicitude in behalf of an orphaned niece a much closer bond the bond between husband and wife united them for when esther had grown to maidenhood mordecai had espoused her naturally esther would have been ready to defend her conjugal honor with her life she would gladly have suffered death at the hands of the king's bailiffs rather than yield herself to a man not her husband luckily there was no need for this sacrifice for her marriage with ahasuerus was but a fiend union god has sent down a female spirit in the guise of esther to take her place with the king esther herself never lived with ahasuerus as his wife at the advice of her uncle esther kept her descent and her faith a secret mordecai's injunction was dictated by several motives first of all it was his modesty that suggested secrecy he thought the king if he heard from esther that she had been raised by him might offer to install him in some high office in point of fact mordecai was right in his conjecture 
Ahasuerus had pledged himself to make lords, princes, and kings of Esther's friends and kinspeople, if she would but name them. Another reason for keeping Esther's Jewish affiliations a secret was Mordecai's apprehension that the fate of Vashti overtake Esther too. If such were in store for her, he desired at least to guard against the Jews becoming her fellow sufferers. Besides, Mordecai knew only too well the inimical feelings entertained by the heathen toward the Jews, ever since their exile from the Holy Land, and he feared that the Jew-haters, to gratify their hostility against the Jews, might bring about the ruin of Esther and her house. Mindful of the perils to which Esther was exposed, Mordecai allowed no day to pass without assuring himself of her well-being. His compensation, therefore, came from God. Thou makest the well-being of a single soul thy intimate concern. As thou livest, the well-being and good of thy whole nation Israel shall be entrusted to thee as thy task. And to reward him for his modesty, God said, Thou withdrawest thyself from greatness. As thou livest, I will honor thee more than all men on earth. Vain were the efforts made by Ahasuerus to draw her secret from Esther. He arranged great festivities for the purpose, but she guarded it well. She had an answer ready for his most insistent questions. I know neither my people nor my family, for I lost my parents in my earliest infancy. But as the king desired greatly to show himself gracious to the nation to which the queen belonged, he released all the peoples under his dominion from the payment of taxes and imposts. In this way, he thought, her nation was bound to be benefited. When the king saw that kindness and generosity left her untouched, he sought to wrest the secret from her by threats. Once, when she parade his inquiries in the customary way, saying, I am an orphan, and God, the father of the fatherless, in his mercy has brought me up. He retorted, I shall gather virgins together the second time. His purpose was to provoke the jealousy of Esther, for a woman is jealous of nothing so much as a rival. When Mordecai noticed that women were being brought to court anew, he was overcome with anxiety for his niece. Thinking that the fate of Vashti might have befallen her, he was impelled to make inquiries about her. As for Esther herself, she was but following the example of her race. She could keep silent in all modesty, as Rachel, the mother of Benjamin, had kept a modest silence when her father gave her sister Leah to Jacob for wife instead of herself, and as Saul, the Benjamite, was modestly reserved when, questioned by his uncle, he told about the finding of his she-asses, but nothing about his elevation to the kingship. Rachel and Saul were recompensed for their self-abnegation by being given a descendant like Esther. THE CONSPIRACY Once the following conversation took place between Ahasuerus and Esther. The king asked Esther, Whose daughter art thou? Esther, And whose son art thou? Ahasuerus, I am a king, and the son of a king. Esther, and I am a queen, the daughter of kings, a descendant of the royal family of Saul. If thou art, indeed, a real prince, how couldst thou put Vashti to death? Ahasuerus, it was not to gratify my own wish, but at the advice of the great princes of Persia and Media. Esther, thy predecessors took no advice from ordinary intelligences. They were guided by prophetical counsel. Arioch brought Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and Belshazzar too, summoned Daniel before him. Ahasuerus, is there aught left of those toothsome morsels? Are there still prophets abroad? Esther, seek, and thou wilt find. The result was that Mordecai was given the position at court, once occupied by the chamberlains Bigthan and Teresh. Indignant that a place once filled by senators should be given to a barbarian, the ousted officials resolved to be revenged upon the king and take his life. 
Their purpose was to administer poison, which seemed easy of accomplishment, as they were the royal butlers, and could find many occasions to drop poison into a cup of water before handing it to the king. The plan successfully carried out would have satisfied their vengeful feelings, not only as to the king, but as to Mordecai as well. It would have made it appear that the death of Ahasuerus was attributable to the circumstance, that he had entrusted his person to the care of the Jew, as his life had been secure under Bigthan and Teresh. They discussed their plans in the presence of Mordecai, acting upon the unwarranted assumption that he would not understand the language they spoke. The Tarshan, their native language, they were ignorant of the fact that Mordecai was a member of the Sanhedrin, and as such knew all the seventy languages of the world. Thus their own tongue betrayed them to ruin. However, Mordecai had no need to make use of his great knowledge of languages. He obtained his information about the plot of the two chamberlains through prophetical channels. Accordingly, he appeared one night in the palace. By a miracle, the guards at the gates had not seen him, and he could enter unrestrained. Thus he overheard the conversation between the two conspirators. Mordecai had more than a single reason for preventing the death of Ahasuerus. In the first place, he desired to secure the king's friendship for the Jews, and more especially his permission for the rebuilding of the temple. Then he feared, if the king were murdered immediately after his rise to a high place in the state, the heathen would assign, as the cause of the disaster, his connection with the Jews, his marriage with Esther, and the appointment of Mordecai to office. Esther's confidence in Mordecai's piety was so great that she unhesitatingly gave credence to the message she received from him concerning the mischievous plot hatched against the king. She believed that God would execute the wishes of Mordecai. Albeit Bigthan and Teresh had no plans of the sort attributed to them by her uncle. They would conceive them now in order to make Mordecai's words true. That Esther's confidence was justified appeared at once. The conspirators got wind of their betrayal to the king, and in good time they removed the poison they had already placed in Ahasuerus's cup. But that the lie might not be given to Mordecai, God caused poison to appear where none had been and the conspirators were convicted of their crime. The king had the water analyzed, which he was given to drink, and it was made manifest that it contained poison. Other evidence, besides, existed against the two plotters. It was established that both had at the same time busied themselves about the person of the king. Though the regulations of the palace assigned definite hours of service to the one different from those assigned to the other. This made it clear that they intended to perpetrate a dark deed in common. The two conspirators sought to escape the legitimate punishment for their dastardly deed by ending their own life, but their intention was frustrated, and they were nailed to the cross. Haman the Jew-baiter The conspiracy of Bigthan and Teresh determined the king never again to have two chamberlains guard his person. Henceforward he would entrust his safety to a single individual, and he appointed Haman to the place. This was an act of ingratitude toward Mordecai, who, as the king's savior, had the most cogent claims upon the post. But Haman possessed one important advantage. He was the owner of great wealth. With the exception of Korah, he was the richest man that had ever lived, for he had appropriated to himself the treasures of the Judean kings and of the temple. Ahasuerus had an additional reason for distinguishing Haman. He was well aware of Mordecai's ardent desire to see the temple restored, and he instinctively felt he could not deny the wish of the man who had snatched him from untimely death. Yet he was not prepared to grant it. To escape from the dilemma, he endeavored to make Haman act as a counterpose against Mordecai, that what the one built up, the other might pull down. Ahasuerus had long been acquainted with Haman's feelings against the Jews. 
when the quarrel about the rebuilding of the temple broke out between the Jews and their heathen adversaries, and the sons of Haman denounced the Jews before Ahasuerus, the two parties at odds agreed to send each a representative to the king to advocate his case. Mordecai was appointed the Jewish delegate, and no more rabid Jew-hater could be found than Haman to plead the case of the antagonists of the temple builders. As for his character, that, too, King Ahasuerus had had occasion to see in its true light, because Haman is but another name for Memukin, the prince who is chargeable in the last resort with the death of Vashti. At the time of the king's wrath against the queen, Memukin was still lowest in the rank among the seven princes of Persia, yet, arrogant as he was, he was the first to speak up when the king put his question about the punishment due to Vashti, an illustration of the popular adage, The common man rushes to the front. Haman's hostility toward Vashti dated from her banquet, to which the queen had failed to bid his wife's guest. Moreover, she had once insulted him by striking him a blow in the face. Besides, Haman calculated, if only Vashti's repudiation could be brought about, he might succeed in marrying his own daughter to the king. He was not the only disappointed man at court. In part, the conspiracy of Bigthan and Teresh was a measure of revenge against Ahasuerus for having made choice of Esther instead of a kinswoman of theirs. Esther once married to the king, however, Haman made the best of a bad bargain. He tried by every means in his power to win the friendship of the queen. Whether she was Jewess or heathen, he desired to claim kinship with her as a Jewish, through the fraternal bond between Esau and Jacob, as a heathen easily enough, for all the heathen area akin to one another. Mordecai's Pride When Ahasuerus raised Haman to his high office, he at the same time issued the order that all who saw him were to prostrate themselves before him and pay him divine honors, to make it manifest that the homage due to him had an idolatrous character, Haman had the image of an idol fastened to his clothes, so that whoever bowed down before him worshipped an idol at the same time. Mordecai alone, of all at court, refused to obey the royal order. The highest officials, even the most exalted judges, showed Haman the reverence bidden by the king. The Jews themselves entreated Mordecai not to call forth the fury of Haman, and cause the ruin of Israel thereby. Mordecai, however, remained steadfast. No persuasion could move him to pay to a mortal the tribute due to divinity. Also the servants of the king, who sat at the gate of the royal palace, said to Mordecai, Wherein art thou better than we, that we should pay reverence to Haman, and prostrate ourselves? and thou doest not of all commanded us in the matter? Mordecai answered, saying, O ye fools without understanding, hear ye my words, and make me to reply thereunto. Who is man, that he should act proudly and arrogantly, man born of woman and few in days? At his birth there is weeping and travailing, in his youth pain and groans, all his days are full of trouble, and in the end he returns unto dust. Before such an one I should prostrate myself? I bend the knee before God alone, the only living one in heaven, he who is the fire consuming all other fires, who holds the earth in his arms, who stretches out the heavens in his might, who darkens the sun when it pleases him, and illumines the darkness who commanded the sand to set bounds unto the seas, who made the waters of the sea salt, and caused its waves to spread an aroma as of wine, who chained the sea as with manacles, and held it fast in the depths of the abyss, that it might not overflow the land. It rages, yet it cannot pass its limits. With his word he created the firmament, which he stretched out like a cloud in the air, he cast it over the world like a dark vault, like a tent it is spread over the earth. In his strength he upholds all there is above and below. The sun, the moon, and the Pleiades run before him. 
the stars and the planets are not idle for a single moment they rest not they speed before him as his messengers going to the right and to the left to do the will of him who created them to him praise is due before him we must prostrate ourselves the court officials spake and said yet we know well that thy ancestor jacob prostrated himself before haman's ancestor esau whereunto mordecai made reply i am a descendant of benjamin who was not yet born when his father jacob and his brothers cast themselves upon the earth before esau my ancestor never showed such honor to a mortal therefore was benjamin's allotment of land in palestine privileged to contain the temple the spot whereon israel and all the peoples of the earth prostrated themselves before god belonged to him who had never prostrated himself before mortal man therefore i will not bend my knee before this sinner haman nor cast myself to earth before him haman at first tried to propitiate mordecai by a show of modesty as though he had not noticed the behavior of mordecai he approached him and saluted him with the words peace be with thee my lord but mordecai bluntly replied there is no peace saith my god to the wicked the hatred of mordecai cherished by haman was due to more than the hereditary enmity between the descendants of saul and agag not even mordecai's public refusal to pay homage due to haman suffices to explain his virulence mordecai was aware of a certain incident in the past of haman if he had divulged it the betrayal would have been most painful to the latter this accounts for the intensity of his feeling it once happened that a city in india rebelled against ahasuerus in great haste troops were dispatched thither under the command of mordecai and haman it was estimated that the campaign would require three years and all preparations were made accordingly by the end of the first year haman had squandered the provisions laid in to supply the part of the army commanded by him for the whole term of the campaign greatly embarrassed he requested mordecai to give him aid mordecai however refused him succor they both had been granted the same amount of provisions for an equal number of men haman then offered to borrow from mordecai and pay him interest this too mordecai refused to do and for two reasons if mordecai had supplied haman's men with provisions his own would have to suffer and as for interest the law prohibits it saying unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury and jacob and esau the respective ancestors of mordecai and haman had been brothers when starvation stared them in the face the troops commanded by haman threatened him with death unless he gave them their rations haman again resorted to mordecai and promised to pay him as much as ten per cent interest the jewish general continued to refuse the offer but he professed himself willing to help him out of his embarrassment on one condition that haman sell himself to mordecai as his slave driven into a corner he acquiesced and the contract was written upon mordecai's kneecap because there was no paper to be found in the camp the bill of sale ran thus i haman the son of ahamanditha of the family of agag was sent out by king ahasuerus to make war upon an indian city with an army of sixty thousand soldiers furnished with the necessary provisions precisely the same commission was given by the king to mordecai the son of shimei of the tribe of benjamin but i squandered the provisions entrusted to me by the king so that i had no rations to give to my troops i desired to borrow from mordecai on interest but having regard to the fact that jacob and esau were brothers he refused to lend me upon usury and i was forced to sell myself as slave to him it now i should at any time decline to serve him as a slave or deny that i am his slave or if my children and children's children unto the end of all time should refuse to do him service if only a single day of the week 
or if I should act inimically toward him on account of this contract, as Esau did toward Jacob after selling him his birthright. In all these cases, a beam of wood is to be plucked out of the house of the recalcitrant, and he is to be hanged upon it. I, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, of the family of Agag, being under no restraint, do hereby consent with my own will, and bind myself to be slave in perpetuity to Mordecai, in accordance with the contents of this document. Later, when Haman attained to high rank in the state, Mordecai, whenever he met him, was in the habit of stretching out his knee toward him, so that he might see the bill of sale. This so enraged him against Mordecai and against the Jews, that he resolved to extirpate the Jewish people. End of chapter 12, section 2. Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana. Chapter 12, part 3 of The Legends of the Jews, volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 4, by Louis Ginsberg. Chapter 12, Esther, Casting the Lots. Haman's hatred, first directed against Mordecai alone, grew apace until it included Mordecai's colleagues, all the scholars, whom he sought to destroy, and not satisfied with even this, he plotted the annihilation of the whole of Mordecai's people, the Jews. Before beginning to lay out his plans, he desired to determine the most favorable moment for his undertaking, which he did by casting lots. First of all, he wanted to decide on the day of the week. The scribe Shimshai began to cast lots. Sunday appeared inappropriate, being the day on which God created heaven and earth, whose continuous depends on Israel's existence. Were it not for God's covenant with Israel, there would be neither day nor night, neither heaven nor earth. Monday showed itself equally unpropitious for Haman's devices for it was the day on which God effected the separation between the celestial and the terrestrial waters, symbolic of the separation between Israel and the heathen. Tuesday, the day on which the vegetable world was created, refused to give its aid in bringing about the ruin of Israel, who worships God with branches of palm trees. Wednesday, too, protested against the annihilation of Israel, saying, On me the celestial luminaries were created, and like unto them Israel is appointed to illumine the whole world. First destroy me, and then thou mayest destroy Israel. Thursday said, O Lord, on me the birds were created, which are used for sin offerings. When Israel shall be no more, who will bring offerings? First destroy me, and then thou mayest destroy Israel. Friday was unfavorable to Haman's lots, because it was the day of the creation of man. And the Lord God said to Israel, Ye are men. Least of all was the Sabbath day inclined to make itself subservient to Haman's wicked plans. It said, the Sabbath is a sign between Israel and God. First destroy me, and then thou mayest destroy Israel. Baffled, Haman gave up all idea of settling upon a favorable day of the week. He applied himself to the task of searching out the suitable month for his sinister undertaking. As it appeared to him, Adar was the only one of the twelve owning naught that might be interpreted in favor of the Jews. The rest of them seemed to be enlisted on their side. In Nisan, Israel was redeemed from Egypt. In Iar, Amlek was overcome. In Siwan, the Ethiopian Zerah was smitten in the war with Asia. In Tamaz, the Amorite kings were subjugated. 
In Ab, the Jews won a victory over Arad, the Canaanite. In Tishra, the Jewish kingdom was firmly established by the dedication of Solomon's temple, while in Heshwan, the building of the temple at Jerusalem was completed. Kislu and Tibet were the months during which Sion and Og were conquered by the Israelites, and in Shabbat occurred the sanguinary campaign of the eleven tribes against the godless children of Benjamin. Not alone was Adar a month without favorable significance in Jewish history, but actually a month of misfortune, the month in which Moses died. What Haman did not know was that Adar was the month in which occurred also the birth of Moses. Then Haman investigated the twelve signs of the zodiac in relation to Israel, and again it appeared that Adar was the most unfavorable month for the Jews. The first constellation, the ram, said to Haman, Israel is a scattered sheep, and how canst thou expect a father to offer his son for slaughter? The bull said, Israel's ancestor was the firstling bullock. The twins, as we are twins, so Tamar bore twins to Judah. The crab, as I am called Saratan, the scratcher, so it is said of Israel, all that oppress him he shall scratch sorely. The lion, God is called the lion. And is it likely the lion will permit the fox to bite his children? The virgin. As I am a virgin, so Israel is compared unto a virgin. The balance. Israel obeys the law against unjust balances in the Torah, and must therefore be protected by the balance. The scorpion. Israel is like unto me, for he too is called scorpion. The archer. The sons of Judah are masters of the bow, and the bows of mighty men directed against them will be broken. The goat. It was a goat that brought blessing unto Jacob, the ancestor of Israel, and it stands to reason that the blessing of the ancestor cannot cause misfortune to the descendant. The water-bearer. His dominion is likened unto a bucket, and therefore the water-bearer cannot but bring him good. The fishes were the only constellation which, at least according to Haman's interpretation, made unfavorable prognostications as to the fate of the Jews. It said that the Jews would be swallowed like fishes. God, however, spake, O thou villain, fishes are sometimes swallowed, but sometimes they swallow, and thou shalt be swallowed by the swallowers. And when Haman began to cast lots, God said, O thou villain, son of a villain, what thy lots have shown thee is thine own lot, that thou wilt be hanged. THE DENUNCIATION OF THE JEWS His resolve to ruin the Jews taken, Haman appeared before Ahasuerus with his accusation against them. There is a certain people, he said, the Jews, scattered abroad, and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom. They are proud and presumptuous. In Tibet, in the depth of winter, they bathe in warm water, and they sit in cold water in summer. Their religion is diverse from the religion of every other people, and their laws from the laws of every other land. To our laws they pay no heed. Our religion finds no favor with them, and the decrees of the king they do not execute. When their eye falls upon us, they spit out before us, and they consider us as unclean vessels. When we levy them for the king's service, they either jump upon the wall and hide within the chambers, or they break through the walls and escape. If we hasten to arrest them, they turn upon us, glare at us with their eyes, grind their teeth, stamp their feet, and so intimidate us that we cannot hold them fast. They do not give us their daughters unto wives, nor do they take our daughters unto wives. If one of them has to do the king's service, he idles all the day long. 
if they want to buy aught of us they say this is a day for doing business but if we want to buy aught of them they say we may do no business to-day and thus we can buy nothing from them on their market days their time they pass in this wise the first hour of the day they say they need for reciting the shama the second for praying the third for eating the fourth for saying grace to give thanks to god for the food and drink he has granted them the fifth hour they devote to their business affairs in the sixth they already feel the need of rest in the seventh their wives call for them saying come home ye weary ones who are so exhausted by the king's service the seventh day they celebrate as their sabbath they go to the synagogues on that day read out of their books translate pieces from their prophets curse our king and execrate our government saying this is the day whereon the great god rested so may he grant us rest from the heathen the women pollute the waters with their ritual baths which they take after the seven days of their defilement on the eighth day after the birth of sons they circumcise them mercilessly saying this shall distinguish us from all other nations at the end of thirty days and sometimes twenty-nine they celebrate the beginning of the month in the month of nisan they observe eight days of passover beginning the celebration by kindling a fire of brushwood to burn up the leaven they put all the leaven in their homes out of sight before they use the unleavened bread saying this is the day whereon our fathers were redeemed from egypt such is the festival they call pisha they go to their synagogues read out of their books and translate from the writings of the prophets saying as the leaven has been removed out of our houses so may this wicked dominion be removed from over us again in siwan they celebrate two days on which they go to their synagogues recite the shama and offer up prayers read out of the torah and translate from the books of their prophets curse our king and execrate our government this is the holiday which they call azarda the closing festival they ascend to their roofs of their synagogues and throw down apples which are picked up by those below with the words as these apples are gathered up so may we be gathered together from our dispersion among the heathen they say they observe this festival because on these days the torah was revealed to their ancestors on mount sinai on the first of tishra they celebrate the new year again they go to their synagogues read out of their books translate pieces from the writings of their prophets curse our king execrate our government and blow the trumpets saying on this day of memorial may we be remembered unto good and our enemies unto evil on the ninth day of the same month they slaughter cattle geese and poultry they eat and drink and indulge in dainties they and their wives their sons and their daughters but the tenth day of the same month they called the great fast and all of them fast they together with their wives their sons and their daughters yea they even torture their little children without mercy forcing them to abstain from food they say on this day our sins are pardoned and are added to the sum of the sins committed by our enemies they go to their synagogues read from their books translate from the writings of their prophets curse our king and execrate our government saying may this empire be wiped off from the face of the earth like unto our sins they supplicate and pray that the king may die and his rule be made to cease on the fifteenth of the same month they celebrate the feast of tabernacles they cover the roofs of their houses with foliage they resort to our parks where they cut down palm branches for their festival wreaths pluck the fruit of the etrog 
and cause havoc among the willows of the brook by breaking down the hedges in their quest after Hashanot, saying, As does the king in the triumphal procession, so do we. Then they repair to their synagogues to pray, and read out of their books, and make circuits with their Hashanot, all the while jumping and skipping like goats, so that there is no telling whether they curse us or bless us. This is Sukkot, as they call it, and while it lasts, they do none of the king's service, for, they maintain, all work is forbidden them on these days. In this way they waste the whole year with tomfoolery and fiddle-faddle, only in order to avoid doing the king's service. At the expiration of every period of fifty years they have a jubilee year, and every seventh year is a year of release, during which the land lies fallow, for they neither sow nor reap therein, and sell us neither fruits nor other products of the field, so that those of us who live among them die of hunger. At the end of every period of twelve months they observe the new year, at the end of every thirty days the new moon, and every seventh day is the Sabbath, the day on which, as they say, the Lord of the world rested. After Haman had finished his arraignment of the Jews, God said, Thou didst well enumerate the holidays of the Jews, yet thou didst omit the two Purim and Shushan Purim, which the Jews will celebrate to commemorate thy fall. Clever though Haman's charge was, the vindication of the Jews was no whit less clever, for they found a defender in the archangel Michael. While Haman was delivering his indictment, he spoke thus to God, O Lord of the world, thou knowest well that the Jews are not accused of idolatry, nor of immoral conduct, nor of shedding blood. They are accused only of observing thy Torah. God pacified him, as thou livest, I have not abandoned them. I will not abandon them. Haman's denunciations of the Jewish people found a ready echo in the heart of the king. He replied, I too desire the annihilation of the Jews, but I fear their God, for he is mighty beyond compare, and he loves his people with a great love. Whoever rises up against them he crushes under their feet. Just think of Pharaoh. Should his example not be a warning to us? He ruled the whole world. Yet, because he oppressed the Jews, he was visited with frightful plagues. God delivered them from the Egyptians and cleft the sea for them, a miracle never done for any other nation. And when Pharaoh pursued them with an army of six hundred thousand warriors, he and his host together were drowned in the sea. Thy ancestor, Amalek, O Haman, attacked them with four hundred thousand heroes, and all of them God delivered into the hands of Joshua, who slew them. Sisera had forty thousand generals under him, each one commander of a hundred thousand men, yet they all were annihilated. The God of the Jews ordered the stars to consume the warriors of Sisera and then he caused the great general to fall into the power of a woman, to become a byword and a reproach for ever. Many and valorous rulers have risen up against them. They all were cast down by their God, and crushed unto their everlasting disgrace. Now, then, can we venture aught against them? Haman, however, persisted, Day after day he urged the king to consent to his plan. Ahasuerus thereupon called together a council of the wise men of all nations and tongues. To them he submitted the question whether the Jews ought not to be destroyed, seeing they differed from all other peoples. The sage counselors inquired, Who is it that desires to induce thee to take so fatal a step? If the Jewish nation is destroyed, the world itself will cease to be. 
for the world exists only for the sake of the Torah studied by Israel. Yea, the very sun and moon shed their light only for the sake of Israel. And were it not for him, there were neither day nor night, and neither dew nor rain would moisten the earth. More than this, all other nations beside Israel are designated as strangers by God. But Israel he called in his love a people near to him and his children. If men do not suffer their children and kinsmen to be attacked with impunity, how much less will God sit by quiet when Israel is assailed, God the ruler over all things, over the powers in heaven above and on earth beneath, over the spirits and the souls God with whom it lies to exalt and to degrade, to slay and to revive. Haman was ready with a reply to these words of the wise. The God who drowned Pharaoh in the sea, and who did all the wonders and signs ye have recounted, that God is now in his dotage. He can neither see nor protect. For did not Nebuchadnezzar destroy his house, burn his palace, and scatter his people to all corners of the earth, and he was not able to do one thing against it? If he had had power and strength, would he not have displayed them? This is the best proof that he was waxed old and feeble. When the heathen sages heard these arguments advanced by Haman, they agreed to his plan, and put their signature to an edict decreeing the persecution of the Jews. THE DECREE OF ANNIHILATION This is the text of the decree which Haman issued to the heads of all the nations regarding the annihilation of the Jews. This herein is written by me, the great officer of the king, his second in rank, the first among the grandees, and one of the seven princes, and the most distinguished among the nobles of the realm. I, in agreement with the rulers of the provinces, the princes of the king, the chiefs and the lords, the eastern kings and the satraps, all being of the same language, write you at the order of King Ahasuerus, this writing sealed with his signet, so that it may not be sent back concerning the great eagle Israel. The great eagle had stretched out his pinions over the whole world, neither bird nor beast could withstand him. But there came the great lion Nebuchadnezzar, and dealt the great eagle a stinging blow. His pinions snapped, his feathers were plucked out, and his feet were hacked off. The whole world has enjoyed rest, cheer, and tranquillity since the moment the eagle was chased from his ire until this day. Now we notice that he is using all efforts to secure wings. He is permitting his feathers to grow, with the intention of covering us and the whole world, as he did unto our forefathers. At the instance of King Ahasuerus, all the magnates of the king of Media and Persia are assembled, and we are writing you our joint advice as follows. Set snares for the eagle, and capture him before he renews his strength and soars back to his ire. We advise you to tear out his plumage, break his wings, give his flesh to the fowl of heaven, split the eggs lying in his nest, and crush his young, so that his memorial may vanish from the world. Our counsel is not like unto Pharaoh's. He sought to destroy only the men of Israel, to the women he did no harm. It is not like unto the plan of Esau, who wanted to slay his brother Jacob, and keep his children as slaves. It is not like unto the tactics of Amalek, who pursued Israel and smote the hindmost and feeble, but left the strong unscathed. It is not like unto the policy of Nebuchadnezzar, who carried them away into exile, and settled them near his own throne. And it is not like unto the way of Sennacherib, who assigned a land unto the Jews, as fair as their own had been. We, 
recognizing clearly what the situation is, have resolved to slay the Jews, annihilate them young and old, so that their name and their memorial may be no more, and their posterity may be cut off forever. The edict issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews ran thus, To all the peoples, nations, and races, peace be with you. This is to acquaint you that one came to us who is not of our nation and of our land, an Amalekite, the son of great ancestors, and his name is Haman. He made a trifling request of me, saying, Among us there dwells a people, the most despicable of all, who are a stumbling-block in every time. They are exceeding presumptuous, and they know our weakness and our shortcomings. They curse the king in these words, which are constantly in their mouths. God is the king of the world for ever and ever. He will make the heathen to perish out of his land. He will execute vengeance and punishments upon the peoples. From the beginning of all time they have been ungrateful, as witness their behavior toward Pharaoh. With kindness he received them, their wives and their children, at the time of a famine. He gave up to them the best of his land. He provided them with food and all they needed. Then Pharaoh desired to build a palace, and he requested the Jews do it for him. They began the work grudgingly, amid murmurings, and it is not completed unto this day. In the midst of it they approached Pharaoh with these words, We wish to offer sacrifices to our God in a place that is a three days' journey from here, and we petition thee to lend us silver and gold vessels and clothes and apparel. So much did they borrow that each one bore ninety ass-loads off with him, and Egypt was emptied out. When, the three days having elapsed, they did not return, Pharaoh pursued them in order to recover the stolen treasures. What did the Jews? They had among them a man by the name of Moses, the son of Amram, an arch-wizard, who had been bred in the house of Pharaoh. When they reached the sea, this man raised his staff and cleft the waters, and led the Jews through them dry-shod, while Pharaoh and his host were drowned. Their God helps them as long as they observe His law, so that none can prevail against them. Balaam, the only prophet we heathens ever had, they slew with the sword, as they did unto Sion and Og, the powerful kings of Canaan, whose land they took after killing them. Likewise they brought ruin upon Amalek, the great and glorious ruler, they, and Saul their king, and Samuel their prophet. Later they had an unmerciful king, David by name, who smote the Philistines, the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and not one of them could discomfit him. Solomon, the son of this king, being wise and sagacious, built them a house of worship in Jerusalem, that they might not scatter to all parts of the world. But after they had been guilty of many crimes against their God, he delivered them into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar, who deported them to Babylonia. To this day they are among us, and though they are under our hand, we are of none account in their eyes. Their religion and their laws are different from the religion, and he laws of all the other nations. Their sons do not marry with our daughters. Our gods they do not worship. They have no regard for our honor, and they refuse to bend the knee before us, calling themselves free men. They will not do our service, and our commands they heed not. Therefore the grandees, the princes, and the satraps have been assembled before us. We have taken counsel together, and we have resolved an irrevocable resolution according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, to extirpate the Jews from among the inhabitants of the earth. We have sent the edict to the hundred and twenty-seven provinces of my empire, to slay them, 
their sons, their wives, and their little children, on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, none is to escape, as they did to our forefathers, and desired to do unto us, so shall be done unto them, and their possessions are to be given over to the spoilers. Thus shall ye do, that ye may find grace before me. This is the writing of the letter which I send to you. Ahasuerus, king of Media and Persia. The price Haman offered the king for the Jews was ten thousand hundredweights of silver. He took the number of the Jews at their exodus from Egypt, six hundred thousand, as the basis of his calculation, and offered a half shekel for every soul of them, the sum each Israelite had to pay yearly for the maintenance of the sanctuary. Though the sum was so vast that Haman could not find coin enough to pay it, but promised to deliver it in the form of silver bars. Ahasuerus refused the ransom. When Haman made the offer, he said, Let us cast lots. If thou drawest Israel, and I draw money, then the sale stands as a valid transaction. If the reverse, it is not valid. Because of the sins of the Jews, the sale was confirmed by the lots. But Haman was not too greatly pleased with his own success. He disliked to give up so large a sum of money. Observing his ill humor, Ahasuerus said, Keep the money. I do not care either to make or to lose money on account of the Jews. For the Jews, it was fortunate that the king did not accept money for them, else his subjects would not have obeyed his second edict the one favorable to the Jews. They would have been able to advance the argument that the king, by accepting a sum of money for them, had resigned his rights over the Jews in favor of Haman, who therefore could deal with them as he pleased. The agreement between Ahasuerus and Haman was concluded at a carouse by way of punishment for the crime of the sons of Jacob, who had unmercifully sold their brother Joseph into slavery to the Ishmaelites while eating and drinking. The joy of this Jew-hating couple, for Ahasuerus, hated the Jews with no less fierce a hatred than Haman did, was shared by none. The capital city of Shushan was in mourning, and sorely perplexed. Scarcely had the edict of annihilation been promulgated against the Jews, when all sorts of misfortunes began to happen in the city. Women who were hanging up their wash to dry on the roofs of the houses dropped dead. Men who went to draw water fell into the wells and lost their lives. While Ahasuerus and Haman were making merry in the palace, the city was thrown into consternation and mourning. End of chapter 12 part 3 recording by scarlet louisiana